Hi, welcome to day two, simple linear regression. And we will not be using matrix algebra today, but in two more days we will, or two more days of videos. So let's first check that you're ready for this. Uh, you should know by now what an estimator is. And in terms of an estimator, what do bias and variance mean? And just generally, what's a mean or an expected value and a variance? So if, you get, if you're not sure about one of those, then check out the basic statistics lingo video. It's only about 15 minutes long and just do a quick review of that before continuing. So here's an important note about linear regression and uh, there was a bit of a discussion about this on the Facebook group. I don't know if we can find that now. So that would have been um, today uh, when this was actually recorded the day before it was posted. And um, I find it interesting the way people report their linear regression results. So if you find age is significant in a model where um, reaction time is the dependent variable, I will stick with the terminology of association, saying age is associated with reaction time. An increase in age is associated with an increase in reaction time. One thing everybody, I think, agrees on is that causality has no place in a standard regression. Uh, causality results come from a different type of approach. So you can't say age getting older causes your reaction time uh, to be longer or something like that. The more sticky word is predictive. So a lot of people would like to say um, older, uh, sorry, older age is predictive of longer reaction time. And I know that some people really, really hate this um, usage of the word prediction. They'd like to save prediction for other types of models. And some people are fine with it. So I tend to choose my battles. I find association to be the cleanest way, and that's what I'm going to go with. So just know you can never use causality. And personally, I wouldn't use predictive or prediction because um, I feel that that's from a different model. OK, so where were we? We were talking about how models help us tell stories. So here we have these data where we have age on the x-axis and reaction time on the y-axis. And it appears that as age increases, reaction time is also increasing. So we are going to fit a line through the data. And a line is exactly what simple linear regression is. So today we're going to focus on estimating these two parameters here, um, the slope and the intercept. We will discuss p-value computation later. So here's the model. I'm going to be expressing it this way today, where the i subscript is for the i observational unit. In this example with reaction time and age, that would be for a single subject. So a single subject's reaction time, we're assuming is equal to some parameter beta naught. Now beta naught's the same for everybody, plus some parameter beta one times their age plus some error term. So the only things that vary by subject here are y, x and epsilon, whereas beta naught and beta one stay the same. There is a parameter actually contained within the epsilon. I will talk about that in a minute. Yi is the dependent or random variable. There are other words for it. Um, those are just two. Um, Xi is the independent variable and it is considered fixed. So it's not random. The model parameters beta naught and beta one and those are two of the parameters, but again, that epsilon contains our variance parameter, which is an important player. So epsilon's the random error, and it describes how the observation deviates from the population mean. So how our subject's reaction time deviates from the population's reaction time. The first portion of this equation is referred to as the fixed part, the beta naught plus beta one xi, because it describes the mean or expected value of yi. The error term is the random component. So it's random because this is where the variance is described. Um, we assume the errors have a mean of zero, so the expected value is zero, and we assume the variance is the same for each subject. So you, if you could imagine you don't collect your data this way necessarily, but if you repeated your study many times with each subject and you could compute their variance in their reaction time, we're assuming that that variability is the same across subjects. Or, yeah. Also, we're assuming, or at least uh, across reaction times, we're also assuming that the subjects are not correlated with each other. So 
those are the common assumptions. Um, with a lot of data, behavioral data in psychology, this assumption gets violated, but I'm definitely not talking about that today, but I will talk about that later because it's something I've been interested in recently. So stay tuned for that. So um, this information about the, the vector epsilon i or about epsilon i transfers then to yi and it follows that the variance of yi is also sigma squared. So again, we have three parameters, beta naught and beta one and sigma squared. So how are we going to estimate these parameters? How do we fit the model? So here I've tossed a couple of candidate lines on the data, and some of them, you know, this one looks pretty bad, but these other two look decent. So which line fits the data best? How do we quantify that? So in fitting models, you always come up with some, some type of uh, loss function or some type of function you want to minimize. And in the case of regression, we want our line to be as close to the data as possible. So this distance dropping down straight from the line to the data point, I'm calling EI, and that is our error term. So the other, earlier I was using epsilon, that's something else, this is EI. And all it is is the actual data value minus the estimated value for that age, in this case, XI. So whenever I put hats on the parameters, that means I've estimated them. So this is yi, and sometimes I'll write this as just yi hat, because it's the estimated reaction time for a given age. So we want to minimize this distance, but there are different ways of minimizing it. You could think about minimizing just the absolute distance, because I know that seems reasonable, or the squared distance or something else. Well, it turns out we use least squares, which is the minimizing the squared distance differences. Um, so minimizing EI squared summed over all subjects, which is equivalent to this expression here, YI minus YI hat, quantity squared summed over all subjects. So that's our goal. We're going to minimize this. It turns out this works out nicely distribution-wise. There are approaches that use, say, an absolute value or something else, but they're a little trickier. And I might talk about those way on down the line. Um, Right, so it works out distribution-wise really nice. So if you've taken calculus, you're familiar with how you minimize an equation. So if you do go through the calculus, you'll find that beta 1 hat is equal to this. This is the solution you get. And beta naught hat is this equation here. Uh, we're gonna, once we learn how to do this using matrices, life will be a lot easier. The properties we have, well, it turns out there's this Gauss-Markov theorem which holds. The only assumptions made are the error has a mean of zero, things aren't correlated by things, I mean in this case, our subjects, so that was the EIs, are, or the epsilon i's are independent, and the variance is the same for all observations. That's, again, uh, another word for that is homoscedasticity. And if those hold, that means that your estimate is unbiased and it has the lowest variance among all unbiased estimators. The first time I read this, I was like, we did it, we won. But then you realize, wait, there were extra words in there. Let's read this more closely. It's not lowest bias, lowest variance. It's unbiased and it has the lowest variance, but just within the category of unbiased estimators. Um, there are some cases actually where we will um, bias our estimate I mentioned ridge regression before and lasso and um, yeah so those are used for a different reason but anyway this is what we get with least squares importantly I have said not a word about normality we don't need normality to get the betas that doesn't need to be the assumption normality comes into play when we're trying to compute our p-values uh, this is also referred to as a best linear unbiased estimator or blue uh, I mentioned that last time and uh, referring back to the bias variance uh, situations from last time, this is basically the situation here. Uh, the variance can be big, but it will be unbiased. So if you repeat your study enough, you'll get the, you're the on average, you'll get the, the bullseye, but it might have high variability. So again, don't forget the variance parameter. We, so far we have our betas. The calculus work I showed you earlier yielded the betas, but we still need our variance, sigma squared. So this is the residual error. 
And to estimate that, we go back to this thing that we actually minimize, the sums of squared error, which is the sum of yi minus yi hat squared. And we take that and we divide by the appropriate degrees of freedom. I don't know why I always found degrees of freedom to be these mystical things. And actually, in some modeling strategies, mixed models, it, they are kind of mystical. Um, and I often wonder if we're using the proper degrees of freedom. But for something nice like this, nice and simple, all it is is the number of independent pieces of information minus the number of parameters in the model. I think of it as a statistical currency. Every subject you collect is great, right? You want to collect data on as many subjects as you want because you know that your models are going to have more power. But every time you estimate a parameter, you have to spend a degree of freedom, and that's exactly what this is uh, quantifying. So in this case, we had two parameters, so we would divide by n minus 2, where n is the number of subjects. Okay, so that's our third parameter, sigma. Multiple linear regression will add more parameters to the model, but if you try to run the calculus on that, it is hairy. So we'll get there. Uh, next time we're going to go over linear algebra. The time after that we'll do multiple linear regression. It's so making sure you got all that. Uh, make sure you remember which parameters in the regression are considered fixed, which ones are considered random. Um, how did we define the best line? What, what is that thing that we minimize? What is that function, that cost function we minimized? How many parameters do you end up estimating in a simple linear regression? And what is a residual? So next time, as I said, it'll be an introduction to basic matrix math. I will talk about the pseudo-inverse and answer the question whether the pseudo-inverse is just a pretend inverse. It isn't. Thanks a lot. Please join the Facebook group and go check out our little discussion about um, prediction and associated with and causality. Of course, there's the Tumblr and also check out Twitter. Thanks again for your participation. Um, yeah, I really enjoy doing this, so I get excited when people watch the videos. Have a great day.